Welcome back to the APSCC webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your host for this, well, your MC for this series and your host for today's webinar, uh, which is about video distribution via satellite, a subject near and dear to all of our hearts. Today, we'll be clarifying the picture. Uh, joining us today, uh, we have Terry Bleakley from Intelsat, John Huddle from SES, and Huang Bao Zhong from APT Satellite. Uh, we're just gonna go straight into it. Uh, and, and because I'm the, the same person uh, at the beginning as I will be in the, in the middle and at the end, uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to, to the discussion and hearing what you have to say about, uh, about the opportunities for video business in Asia. Um, let, let's actually kick off because one of the things I think that is, that is the, the premise that this whole discussion is built around is that there remains a business opportunity for video distribution via satellite in Asia. Not only is there an opportunity, but there's a growing opportunity. Um, Terry, why don't you take that one off the bat? I mean, to what extent do you reckon, reckon that there is new business to be had in Asia? And, and how is that looking? Yeah, good morning, Chris. And look, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. Uh, look, I'll focus on, on three areas where I think there's opportunities for, for growth um, for satellite operators in Asia Pacific. Um, one is around SD to HD migration. The second is around new platforms such as HITS platforms. And the third will deal with um, seeing some of our customers, the content providers going direct to customer and what opportunity that opens for us. So if I look at those three, um, the first one is uh, standard def definition to high definition. If we look at just our own uh, bouquet of C-band distribution on our Asia assets, uh, between 2018 and 2020, we saw um, a growth of around 12.5% of our HD content on those satellites. In the same period, we saw a decline in our SD um, channels of about 2%, uh, but overall it was growth. And what was leading that growth was, was migration to high definition. And if we drill down a bit more in that, and if we look at, say, one specific market, India, in India, I think the MIB has licensed about you know, 920 odd channels. That's remained pretty stable over the last couple of years. There's been a slight increase. Not all of those are being broadcast. The ones we're most interested in are the pay TV channels and there's over 320 pay TV channels in India. Um, but of those, only 95 are high definition. Um, the 235, balance uh, are um, standard definition channels. And uh, what's going to be the impetus for, for more of those channels to become high definition is to attract advertising revenues. And advertising revenues are attracted by eyeballs. And what we've seen over the last few years in India, if you look at just 2018 to 2020, we see an increase in viewership of HD content of 140%, which is a massive increase in viewership. So as those eyeballs come across, the advertisers get more interested in the HD content. We know that people watch HD content longer than they watch standard def definition content. So, so we see uh, a migration to which HD driving some growth for us. If we, the um, second point I brought up was, was different ways that we're looking to distribute. Um, and uh, there are HITS platforms that have emerged. So HITS is head end in the sky. And effectively what happens with a HITS platform, it's, it's like a, a direct to home, but it's not to the home, it's to the cable head end for distribution. And it's not using KU band, it's using C band frequencies. So we, we, uh, we support uh, a large HITS platform in India uh, known as Next Digital, it was previously known as Hinduja. Uh, and they've been very successful in, in distributing their content using that platform. Uh, and we've seen others um, come to us, uh, and I'm sure they're going to John and uh, Bong Song as well, to, to look at um, a capacity availability for replicating such a model. So, so there's another area we see, see opportunities. And, and the last one uh, I'll talk about, and I'm sure uh, the guys have others to talk about here too, is is we see um, content providers going to direct to consumer. We see uh, Disney Plus, we see uh, HBO Max, and uh, they're really interested in the consumer experience. Um, and one of the exclusive areas where satellite uh, can provide a, a different experience is connectivity to things that move, to things like aircraft, um, ships, 
trains, uh, etc. Uh, and to that end, uh, Intelsat uh, last year uh, bought GoGo Commercial Aviation for four hundred million dollars. That's now been integrated uh, into Intelsat as a commercial aviation division. Um, they connect over three thousand aircraft, um, twenty airlines, um, and those. 3,000 aircraft relate to 200 million passengers per year. Uh, that's pre-COVID days. So we're not there at the moment, and we'll come back to that uh, as COVID sort of moves, um, moves as it does. Um, and, and that creates a great opportunity for us to speak to content operators uh, and tell them we can now touch their, their customer base whenever they're traveling, whether it be on a plane whether it be on a, uh, a cruise ship, we touch 90% of cruise ships that are out there. So, you know, what, 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 our, what our proposal to those players is, is that we can give their consumers the same experience as they have at home when they're on a plane and when they're on a cruise ship uh, and over time when they're on a train and a bus, et cetera. And it's really an exclusive area for, for satellite operators. So we see a lot of potential and we're tapping on that at the moment. Those are, those are great areas to touch on. And there's just to unpack those is, you know, a webinar on each really. Um, but we will follow up on some of those things. And you've actually, you've actually teed up a couple of, uh, of future points that we've already, uh, we've already got on our list. Let me throw that over though, uh, Bao Zhong, you're also dealing with a lot of the, the cable operators as, as clients. Uh, you know, what, what, are, are, what are you seeing the, the same sort of overlap with Terry with the, the areas that he just mentioned? Uh, uh, in our case, uh, slightly different. Uh, we saw dramatically slow down in the uh, uh, TV business, and um, especially for the international broadcasters, uh, uh, I, I believe that the world already acknowledged that uh, more and more international broadcasters has uh, reduced their uh, satellite TV channels and then focus more on the terrestrial. Uh, the, the streaming uh, video, uh, especially after the two biggest merger, uh, you know, uh, AT and T and HBO, so uh, that's an inevitable trend that in the future the satellite uh, uh, contribution or distribution uh, market will will be shrinking. So this okay, is there's, uh, there's no no question that mergers on the content side, mergers yeah. and acquisitions have definitely had an impact on the number of channels available. Yeah. Um, are you seeing new business though? There, there, is there, are there new opportunities? New business, uh, uh, we saw slight growth uh, in the maritime uh, video uh, uh, business. Uh, perhaps uh, that could be one trend in the future uh, for, the, for the ships, uh, uh, for the, uh, especially for the fishing, fishing uh, ships and for the other uh, mobility services. Uh, the TV, uh, satellite TV could play some uh, role there. And in Asia Pacific, uh, we did not see uh, dramatic re reduction in the uh, in the uh, uh, business, but uh, more or less uh, kept us stable. But another big uh, big problem is the payment issue. Uh, in our case, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, in South Asia market, uh, we encountered big problems of uh, you know collecting money. So this is another, uh, partly due to the pandemic and partly due to, um, you know, the shrinking of the uh, business. Okay. Yeah. That's, 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 that's interesting stuff. Again, something else that we, we will talk about is the client's business and how, how that's changing. Um, John, quickly, though, to, to get to you, I know that SES has a, a lot of business in DTH. Um, yeah. You know, as as opposed to hits, DTH, you know, is is truly a consumer facing proposition. How are you seeing that uh, in terms of in terms of opportunities in the region, as well as the other video distribution business that SES is engaged in? Yeah, no, I mean, Chris, I think uh, I mean, firstly, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak uh, speak to the panel this morning. I mean, I, I would start by reiterating that you know, in 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 this part of the world, DTH continues to remain the prevalent way for most people to consume video content. And we absolutely see growth in our in our core DTH business. Uh, and I think that's driven by a number of areas, right? So firstly, through, uh, you know, low ARPU packages uh, for, for emerging markets, uh, as Terry clearly mentioned, HD services. And then in the more developed markets, we see, uh, you know, operators adopting a hybrid 
DTH OTT premium service, which is really enabling them to uh, to drive growth as well. So, you know, if we look at the markets where 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 we serve customers, I mean, can, clearly in India, DTH is growing. The, the subscriber base is growing um, with these low cost, low ARPU services nationally, whilst also catering to the premium segment with the growth in HD and the hybrid services. The Philippines market grew through the pandemic, despite the closure of one of the, the major DTH platforms due to regulatory reasons. And again, that, that's reflecting what we see as demand for these low ARPU platforms, specifically with national reach, aggregating local and international TV channels. But we also see growth in new platforms. And so, for example, in Malaysia, which is obviously a very mature market with a strong incumbent. You know, we, we're proud now to be working with a new player called Sirius TV, who are delivering a, a new bundle of channels across our SES 12 satellite, uh, five of which are also in HD. So the bouquet continues to expand, new entrants do come into the market, albeit, you know, few and far between. And, and I think Sirius TV is, is a good example how satellite operators can evolve as well because we don't only provide them with satellite bandwidth, we also provide them with cloud-based playout services. And that, you know, that was a complete offering. So I think, you know, we absolutely see, see growth across the region there. And, and finally, I guess I would say, we're also beginning to see growth in, in ways we can, you know, use satellite to help bridge the digital divide and reach unserved and underserved consumers with the delivery of content to the edge. Right, so I know we're going to talk a bit about OTT and 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 linear and and the evolving, uh, the evolving world. But at the same time, you know, we're we're working with partners where we can push content to the edge, where it can then actually be consumed without the need for broadband or or mobile connectivity. Again, as as predicted, we're you know there's a lot of overlap in the, the kind of questions and the topics we've got to. But you know, you look at the Malaysian market, you talk about the the, the new market entrant. Uh, trying to shake things up and disrupt things. I mean, disruption seems to be the the watchword of the, the the past few years in the video business. You know, regardless of of which side of the the, the you know which upstream or downstream you're talking about. Um, you know, Terry, we we talked about the consolidation on the content side for the companies that are actually producing the channels and producing the content. Um, we're also seeing tremendous disruption on the on the on the, the client side. Uh, the last mile, the, the 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 aggregators and the distributors, the cable operators uh, that are that are you know the telcos that are putting out video services. How is that? How is that making it more difficult to to keep business relationships and and to keep the the relevance of of the 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 satellite the satellite link in that value chain? Yeah, look, look I think it's a, a great question. Um, Look, Intelsat has been broadcasting for many, 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 many years, and we've seen lots of sure. and we've seen lots of disrupt, disruption. It goes back to 1967 when we did the first ever live video with the Beatles playing "All You Need Is Love" to 450 million people across five continents. So, hopefully, we'll share a little love on this panel. Um, and that was followed up pretty closely by um, a guy jumping on the moon and making a great leap in 1969. And we reached an audience with our constellation of satellites of 650 million people. Uh, amazing event uh, at that time. And I remember I was five years old in a little village, watched it communally with about 100 people on the black and white TV. And I still have that memory in my mind. But so we've been around broadcasting for a long time and we've seen a lot of change and a lot of disruption. We've seen the world go from analog to digital. We've seen it go from tape to tapeless. Uh, and we've still been a critical part of, of the distribution chain. Um, our teleports, our infrastructure have adapted um, to the different workflows, uh, to the IP world, um, and we're now a highway to the cloud. So I think we adapt as we go along. I think the beauty about satellite is its inherent nature, one to many. It's it's great for, for, for multicast broadcast capabilities. And that's what people want, what content providers want. They want to see as many eyeballs as, as they possibly can. So you know, part of our challenge is to make ourselves part of that direct disruption using the technology that we have, which is so, so well, well attuned to broadcast. And I think, you know, 
re-emphasizing one of the points that, that John made, uh, taking content to the edge is critical. Um, if, if you look at uh, the 5G standard, which um, people are implementing now, uh, uh, edge device computing is a critical part of that. And satellite is an ideal way of getting content that is the same going to many sites to the edge as quickly as possible. And it takes a lot of stress off the network. Uh, video to towers is another one where we see in a lot of the developing places, people aren't consuming media via um, home broadband. They're using their, their mobile phones for connectivity. So getting that content as close to them as possible is, is key here. So again, satellite becomes a, a critical part of, of uh, this new world, this new disrupt world we're, we're sort of um, working in. I think if, if you look at Intelsat itself, um, this is my phone's buzzing in the background. Sorry about that, but it's my third, second son's birthday today. I think he's calling, asking for a present. Um, if you look at what we're doing just with our network, um, you know, we are developing a, a unified network, uh, a software-defined network, which includes software-defined satellites, software on the ground, which is enhanced by virtualization, and it's a 5G standard, right? And, and that's in the process of being made, the software to find satellites are in the factory. We're talking to people who do the virtualization on the, the ground and it's, you know, it's a couple of years away, but it's where the future's leading us. And it will enable um, content providers to, to, to seamlessly integrate with this global network we're developing. So we think that will also um, suit many of what our content providers are trying to do in the future. So. You know, we've seen a lot of disruption. There's a lot coming forward. We have ways of adapting. But, but you know, the, the inherent thing here is satellite is a great medium for broadcast. So, uh, John, I mean, this, this adaptation is really what the business is about. I know that SES has, in fact, changed its whole business model to sort of uh, be more client focused and, and to deal with the way that, that clients are now changing their business models. I mean, uh, you know, when Terry talks about new software defined satellites, new new ground systems, all of all of the rest of that stuff is part of the adaptation that has to take place. But in some ways, those are solutions looking for a problem, or are they solutions adapting with a problem? I mean, I think uh, you know, I think Terry has it exactly right. That you know, these are these are solutions to to to, to problems that, that that you know that clearly do do exist and and you know it's clear that that our challenge is to remain relevant to to our customers and to do that and to be relevant we have to innovate and you know innovation always starts with understanding those the customer experiences and the challenges they face and you know so from an SES perspective whilst we obviously have continued to invest uh, you know as 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 Terry and Intelsat have done in the, the core satellite broadcast technology, we've also built up a wealth of experience in cloud. And we've been putting in place infrastructure and partnerships to support it, because I think we all realize that the broadcast landscape has fundamentally changed, right? And so we talk to uh, a lot of broadcasters now who are looking to take advantage of a, a hybrid distribution model, marrying you know, the traditional skills that we're known for in linear TV distribution and, and marrying that with OTT distribution. Um, and I think, you know, the, the reason for this is when you think about the consumer experience, you know, even on my TV here at home uh, in Singapore, uh, the, the traditional linear and the OTT, they're totally separate environments. You know, for example, you know, when I want to watch, uh, watch the BBC or when I want to watch, uh, you know, content from, from another content provider, I have to switch an app. Even on my uh, even on my TV, and so it's a really fragmented experience. And I think the challenge broadcasters are looking at is that they have you know one set of workflows for the linear environment, one set of workflows for the OTT environment, and and this fragmentation on the back end is a challenge that that we see you know ourselves in in a good position to help them solve through the cloud, because cloud really allows our, our broadcast customers. The ability to optimize their content for different devices and user experience um, and allows them to deliver content to any device whether that's uh, you know linear or OTT so you know we think this this platform flexibility uh, marrying the traditional strengths of satellite with the with the experiences we've we've built up in cloud is is really going to allow us to remain you know super relevant to to broadcasters and DTH operators, you know, giving them reliable, efficient, high quality 
content at, at the same time as offering them this sort of seamless back-end uh, experience. So, Baljong, I mean, back to the, 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 the idea of the, the business models of the clients changing, are you, are you also finding that that adaptation uh, is making new demands on, on you as a, as a partner, as a supplier? Uh, in our region uh, of business, uh, we do not see much happening uh, on that uh, part. Okay. Uh, we we uh, definitely believe that the satellite through uh, uh, the distribution uh, through satellite will definitely be part of a majority, uh, a very important business of the satellite operators. Uh, but we have to be well prepared that for uh, for a quite long time period, uh, the challenge will be uh, huge for the uh, satellite operators. Mm -hmm. And no matter you like it or not, I think uh, I'm on the pes uh, pessimistic side. I'm actually glad that you're on the pessimistic side, <laughs> not, be, not, not because I, I want to endorse pessimism, but because uh, I was a little worried when we started this that all three of you were going to agree about everything. And that, was, it was, that doesn't always make for the best of panels. So it's good to have a little bit of, of discussion and, uh, and, and interaction on this. Um, so so your, your pessimism is more about the satellite operator's ability to adapt or about the business models of the, of the client's. Uh, in fact, adapting away from satellite. Of course, uh, we are heavily relying on our, our clients, uh, like uh, uh, our clients is broadcasters and cable operators. And, uh, you know, uh, for the DTH business, uh, it, uh, the, 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 the viewers in different, different region. Uh, the, the good point is uh, uh, we understand some of the broadcasters, uh, they also uh, change their business model. Uh, uh, you know, they rather focused on the KU band based the regional specific distribution of their content, rather using a wide range of coverage uh, formerly undertaken by C band. C -band. So this is, could be a future change, uh, but this is not happening or uh, uh, quickly. You know, on that on that idea, not necessarily with the C band versus KU band, but in terms of the the, the changes to the business model. Um, one of the things that we, we talked about is the, the idea that linear broadcasting is being uh, taken over, overtaken by OTT services of, of some sort. Um, is that the case? Do we, are we seeing that in the marketplace? Is, in fact, the demise of linear uh, happening or is it just being worried about? Uh, well, it's uh, definitely happening. It's definitely yeah, happening. I, I would argue that point. Um, yeah, me too. I read too much. Press. Good arguments. I like it. Go for it. <laughs> we, we, we read too much press that comes from North America, and that influences what we think so much. And it's written with the landscape of what's happening in North America about uh, cutting cord, right? But if you look at the numbers in Asia um, for linear TV viewing, uh, they've remained constant since 2012. So on average in Asia Pacific, people are watching 140 minutes of linear TV every day. I don't know where they get time to do that. <laughs> if you work for a company like I work for, they don't have kids like I have. But oh, um, well, yeah. So 140 minutes a day, crazy, right? So, and that has remained constant from 2012. We're not seeing a drop off. So we're not seeing cords being cut in Asia. Now what has grown is OTT consumption during that period. So there's no doubting that that has, has grown. So it was almost non-existent in 2012. Now it's hitting 100 minutes. But linear TV has stayed around that 140-minute mark, right? So OTT, in other words, is additive, not subtractive. Absolutely. Adding so to this viewing, is the it's not coexistence that we like to talk about. And I kind of looked at that and I thought, you know, why? And I've come up with three, three ideas, and, and John um, maybe has more. But look, first, firstly, in Asia... It's very common to live in intergenerational homes, and, and that's not so much the case in, in North America. So, you know, in, in homes in Singapore, in China, and in, in Japan, you have grandparents with parents with children, uh, and sometimes um, great grandchildren in that, in that house. So, you have three or four generations in a home, and that makes the average age of a household quite high. Uh, and we know that the tendency is for 
uh, baby boomers like myself and even Generation X to be more comfortable viewing in a, a, in a uh, medium that they were brought up with. So linear TV uh, creates comfort and continues. If you look at the average age of a household uh, in, in Japan, it's 48. Um, aging population syndrome there as well. In, in Korea, it's 43. And in China, it's 38. So these are three big consumers of, of, uh, of broadcast um, content. And, and having these older generations in the home, and normally the, the television is used as a communal uh, aspect within that home. And then the kids go off to their room or the parents, not the grandparents, and they, they consume their OTT in their room, um, watching whatever they want to watch. So, so that's, that's one area. I think another big area that we fail to recognize or, or that North Americans and others fail to recognize is the poor infrastructure that a lot of Asia Pacific has. So you go to many places uh, in, in Indonesia, in, in uh, Malaysia, in Laos, in Cambodia, and you don't have good broadband to the home. And a lot of things that have made OTT successful is they've ridden off the broadband to the home that exists in countries, like in Singapore, broadband to the home exists because you've got gigabit fiber to the home. In Australia, it's the NBN build out that has made broadband accessible to the home in, in New Zealand, it's UFB. So these are government funded projects that have brought broadband to the home. And OTT operators have been able to ride on those without actually having to pay to build out those systems. So they've been very successful in those markets, but there are many, many markets in Asia where getting to the home is a challenge. And that's why satellite still remains very, very important. And I think the third thing is, I call it sort of show me the money aspect. And where is the advertising revenue in, in Asia Pacific? And the advertising revenue is predominantly in, in broadcast television. So S&P Group uh, have done a forecast that, that's, that estimates the advertising revenue business for broadcast TV in 2024 will be $44.4 billion. $44.4 billion. And for online data consumption, for online media consumption, it will reach $10 billion. So you've got almost a $35 billion gap uh, in access to advertising revenues uh, between broadcast TV and uh, OTT consumption. So that's a big reason also that, that broadcast TV will remain relevant. It's where uh, the advertising revenues are and will continue for some time. We'll put over to you, John. And yeah, then, I mean, look, uh, I, 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 I clearly I'm in violent agreement with Terry on this. And I, I think, um, you know, it's probably good to also understand, you know, the U.S. I think is is almost unique in 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 the world of of cord cutting right and the reason the reason i think that's true is because the you know the arpu of of uh of, of traditional packages in the us is it's like a hundred dollars right we and so people will naturally gravitate away from that you know they're paying a lot for content uh, a lot of which they don't necessarily watch but one of the things that we certainly have seen is now that us consumers are beginning to stack uh, OTT subscription services on on top of themselves. That's costing them almost as much almost as as, much as their old cable DTH package. So the return I, of return of the bundle, really. Is yeah, what, is yeah. What I mean, it's yeah. but but it's kind of your, your own bundle, right? And and look, I mean, I I, I think to, to to build on Terry's point, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves that the challenges that that the OTT uh, operators have are, are fairly Herculean, right? Particularly around profitability and monetization. I mean, Netflix only became profitable after they scaled to 300 million subscribers. Disney, I think, is, is the most interesting, uh, you know, use case or challenge in, in this part of the world as they, as they look to replace the, the almost $10 billion they've been getting in, in, in carriage and licensing revenues with, with a move to the direct-to-consumer Disney Plus play. And so for local OTTs to scale at this level, that's going to be, you know, challenging to say, to say the least. Um, you know, I think linear TV remains absolutely crucial, as, as Terry said, to broadcasters for their ad revenues. I think, I think, you know, Star India, for example, their broadcast av advertising revenue is about 75% uh, higher than what they make on Hotstar. Um, and so, you know, and, and that's with Hotstar for, for IPL reaching 300 million people. 
Um, and for us, then this makes you know OTT a complementary business to the TV mm. to the TV world. So yeah, I mean, I think you know when you look at look at the way uh, the OTTs are trying to you know they're trying to address this this model. You know, one is and for them to stay relevant, one is you know they look at ad based, but but we know that's a challenge. Two is they uh, they consolidate. Um, you know, three is maybe they, they do deals with hardware manufacturers, whether it's Amazon, Roku, Apple TV, and then and then four, and this is something that's relevant for us, is is they work with pay TV operators, and they bundle a service, the, the sort of hybrid model that, that 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 we talked about. And you know, I can't, I guess, emphasize enough that the, on the unserved and, and underconnected. I mean, as, as Terry rightly pointed out. There's huge parts of Asia that will never really be connected enough to enjoy an OTT only experience. I mean, India, as we know, is, is kind of almost the land of free data. It still has the largest TV audience and growing. And I think 96 percent of, of TV homes in India are single TV homes, which means it almost becomes like a communal experience. And, and when you look at where the OTT revenue in India is coming from, it's coming from the metro cities and the tier one cities. Rural India, where 70% of the population live, still doesn't have the connectivity in place to, to support an OTT environment. And, and this is where I you know, believe satellite has a huge role to play because we remain uniquely positioned to be able to address that. So, so Bajong, in terms of, the, in terms of the, the supplemental versus dominant idea that that OTT is taking over. Uh, I mean, you heard what Terry and, and, and John had to say as, as very much linear first. What are you seeing? Is it, is it is the conversation about uh, trying to provide hybrid services among the clients and on the, on the, the operators? Or, or what is, where, where does your, your pessimism come from? Uh, right now, uh, my understanding is the broadcasters uh, will uh, use a hybrid uh, way to transmit their content. Um, uh, but what I want to uh, explain is, if you look at uh, what the uh, the broadcasters is doing, uh, like uh, Fox, like uh, uh, Disney, um, maybe very soon, or uh, even uh, Discovery, and uh, you know uh, AXN, uh, a lot of them now they are changing mind. You know they uh, definitely sooner or later they will. Uh, you know, uh, abandon lots of satellite TV channels. So this is happening. Uh, I'm not talking about that the satellite will not play a role, but the, the importance of the satellite distribution uh, may not be as dominant as, as it is before. So, this so really, is, so um, really, may, maybe a time frame discussion. Yeah. Whether the the time frame being right now, the next few years, there's still very much an opportunity. You're looking slightly longer term, Bajong. Is that and correct? And also, I'm looking at the trend. Uh, if you look at the financial status of the broadcasters, uh, be it in uh, uh, Asia Pacific or international broadcasters, or even uh, uh, in China, you know, uh, previously we all know that the Chi Chinese TV stations are wealthy yeah. you know they have lots of money they don't know how to stand right now <laughs> most of them are in financial difficulties and this is also true in most of the other asia pacific broadcasters so um, if you look at the trend uh, you will see where the ad money will go they will go from the linear or go to the streaming so um, that it will manifest itself. Okay, so those that's the trend. Um, and and I, th I think that, that uh, John Terry, I don't think you're gonna disagree that it's happening um, and that, that North America, it, it's happening at, at a certain pace and, in a, and, a, and a certain kind of inescapability, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely, it's also happening here just more slowly and uh, all of the infrastructure problems we talked about as well. Um, but, but also there's, there are genres where it's not going to happen. I mean, the content business is the content people's business. Um, but certainly there are, there are areas where it can't be dis, displanted. Displanted? Is that, the right, is that even a word? I'm not sure. But the, you're not going to get rid of linear broadcasting. Uh, and it feels to me like that's live. Anything that's live is still going to be linear. I mean, is, is that 
Is that correct? Is that being borne out? I throw it to you, John. Yeah, I mean, look, I, 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 I tend to agree that there are certain genres where, where linear isn't going to be uh, going to be replaced. I mean, I, I, I also take uh, Bao Zhong's point. Look, you know, we are certainly seeing international content potentially permanently moving in this part of the world to an OTT format. And, you know, Disney is, is the, the prevalent example there. But, but I still see local language content because of all the other challenges remaining prevalent on linear TV, right? So content created in, in local languages, at least in the markets we serve, I think, uh, I think will, will be hard to, to supplant for all of the reasons we've talked about. And then, yeah, clearly the distribution of live content such as sports and news, um, linear makes sense because the best quality and reach are still delivered today via a linear channel. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, the, the, for broadcasters, uh, revenue coming from advertisements, despite growth in the online video advertising space, um, the, the show me the money question is still predominantly with, uh, with, with, with linear. So, um, you know, people talk about explosive growth in that, but it's obviously starting from a very small base. So yeah, I would say news, sports, um, and, and any content that has to be delivered in the highest possible quality is still going to remain uh, predominant on linear. Terry, thoughts? Yeah, look, look I'd, I'd uh, violently agree with John. Um, <laughs> Stop with the violence. Just yeah, let's sorry. All, so, what was the peace and love? Violence, uh, peace and love a minute ago. <laughs> ne never say never. Is that, uh, is that a James Bond? <laughs> could could be, yeah. There is a never um, again. And who owns it now? Amazon. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, look, look I, I agree. Um, you know, linear TV really lends itself to um, certain genres, uh, and those being the ones that John spoke about live events, television, sports. Um, because of its reliability, uh, because of its reach, um, because when you add a user, you don't add a cost to the network. When you have a CDN network, every time you add a user, there's a cost implication and there's a stress on the network. With satellite, you can keep on adding in the end, yeah. and there's no stress at all on the network. And also it gets delivered um, uh, more reliably, it's scalable and, and a little faster. And I'm just saying a couple of seconds, a couple of frames ahead. But in a live event, that becomes crucial because that goal or, as I would like to say, that try is scored and, and you know, I've already got the text from someone ruining it for me because I've been sure. watching an OTT feed that's still buffering. <laughs> um, so, so so I think, I think you know, th those are the ones that lend themselves to, to linear TV. I'd, I'd also... I agree with, with John's point on regionalization. You know, I, I, I do see uh, Balzong's point on, on consolidation, and we do see some of the large broadcasters um, sort of shying away a little from, t uh, from satellite distribution. I think they might come back. I think they see the world and the universe very much from a US perspective. And when they see they're not getting those uh, subscribers because there's no broadband connectivity to a lot of the places they didn't realize they couldn't touch anymore, uh, we may see uh, a return um, um, to, to, to the medium. But regionalization of content is something that makes uh, things successful. Uh, and regionalized content is uh, of less importance to those um, large broadcasters and, and delivery of that via satellite makes absolute sense. So I, I want to come back to another point that we uh, that we touched on before, Terry, uh, uh, in particular, this was yours. And this is something we first started talking about in the context of, 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 of TV distribution over satellite 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And that was the transition from SD to HD. Um, <laughs> Terry, you reckon that there's still a, a big opportunity there. Um, to what extent is that is that really the growth opportunity for satellite? To what extent is it also from analog to digital? Because, I mean, that's a transition that's still going on, is from analog TV to digital TV. Um, obviously, the next stage in that evolution is from, from HDTV to UHD TV. These technological things, again, are we putting the cart before the horse? Are we putting the North American trend ahead of the Asian uh, uh, find me a metaphor. Uh, uh, Bajong, I'll, I'll give you first crack at this as well. Um, be as pessimistic or optimistic as you like. I don't. I don't care. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, you know, from SD to HD, it is still uh, ongoing. So uh, 
still more TV channels uh, will switch from SD to HD. But originally, they use the dual transmission. For example, uh, some broadcasters uh, will simultaneously uh, you know, distribute the SD channel and HD channel. But the, uh, uh, the problem now, uh, why the capacity is, uh, the, 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 the utilization of capacity is reducing is because they switched off gradually the SD channel and only transmit with uh, HD. HD yeah. But the, the long expected uh, HD to 4K is not going well. So then uh, that's why we see uh, temporarily, uh, we did not see the dramatic growth in the capacity consumption. And uh, for the uh, some financially sound TV channels, uh, they can go to 4K, uh, but still on the uh, trial, uh, trial phase. So the, the dominant, uh, uh, what, what should I say? Uh, the major income driven uh, TV channels are still on HD. I mean, John, the first, 4K live transmission test that, that we put on when I was with Casbah was actually an SES test, as I remember. Um, you know, to, and that was from Europe. Uh, mm. is, are you seeing that 4K trend that's developing elsewhere? Are you even seeing a hint of it out here? Or, or you, or, yeah, or, I mean, I, I think... Obviously, uh, you know, here we are, we are behind the rest of the world. I mean, I think UHD adoption is happening. Uh, it's just happening in a slightly different way, right? So all the major broadcasters produce content in UHD and they distribute it today via OTT platforms. And what we're seeing okay. is that, you know, these, these content guys are not lining up their UHD content in, in a linear format because... The value chain isn't necessarily ready yet in this part of the world, right. and and the distribution costs go up as well. I think you know what what we see as a good example of, and I, I would give two examples of people who are adopting, uh, you know, UHD in this part of the world is Astro in in Malaysia, right? So with their Ultra Box, you know, you can get your live TV, but you can also get 4K UHD uh, VOD content, VOD content. And Airtel, for example, in India with their extreme hybrid box are doing exactly the same, right? So they're delivering UHD content uh, to the hybrid box. I think they had something like 250,000 boxes installed in the first quarter of this year, and they estimate to have about 5 million boxes. So I think it's it's understanding the whole, the whole value chain. And, you know, that's in this part of the world, you've got to think it's both the TV set, it's the set top box, and it's the network in place to receive a UHD linear channel. And I think we're, we're some, some ways away from being able to do that. So I, I would say it's happening. It's just not necessarily happening the way we necessarily expect it to, to be with a load more capacity on distribution satellites. We're, we're focusing on 4K, but that's, and, and that's obviously the, the, the sort of the, the thick end of the wedge, but the thin end of the wedge is still analog to digital, digital to, uh, SD to HD. I, I mean, that, that's that's a that's an ongoing transformation as well. John, sorry, that was a, or, or, sorry, jump, jump, yeah, you please, Terry, go. Yeah, look, look I'll, I'll talk about the first part and then I'll jump on the second part, and the guys can add to it. But uh, yeah, I love to talk about history, don't I? Like, <laughs> it comes with I, age, my friend. It comes yeah, with I tell age. you, <laughs> at least I've got a memory still, so I'll use it while I've got it. Um, <laughs> Use so I, remember you can, I, yeah. I used to work yeah. for a regional satellite company called Miasat, great company. And um, uh, one of the first things I did when I joined was develop a HD neighbourhood. I think it was one of the first HD neighbourhoods for C-band distribution uh, at the time. But that was 2006. So 2006, we developed a HD neighbourhood. I think A&E were on it. We put other people on it. Um, uh, so that was 15 years ago. It's taken 15 years and we still don't have mass adoption of HD in Asia. There's still opportunities, as I pointed out earlier, in India and in other places. So, you know, there's still, as, as others have said, the opportunity to go from SD, HD, and the SDP drops out. When it comes to UHD, you know, I'd, I'd agree with a lot of what John's saying. It, it's easier for OTT to distribute um, 
the 4K content to the to the home because it doesn't have uh, the workflow or the infrastructure challenges that it does for a DTA, DTH or a cable operator where you have to change your head end, uh, you need to change the set-top boxes, uh, they need to be uh, 4K enabled, and most of them, those set-top boxes have been put out there in the last five years to capture the HD audience, and, and if they were put out three years ago, they didn't have uh, 4K UHD capability. So there's a big cost there, right? Um, I, I went online to try and see if I could get HD content from Sky TV in New Zealand on their DTH platform. And they said, wait for the rollout of, of our new boxes in the coming years. So again, you see infrastructure causing challenges there. Um, I, I think to your second point on, on um, analog uh, digitization or the, the, the analog switch off, the, um, you know, th there was a convention in Geneva in 2006 where I think 119 old countries committed to go digital. Um, in 2018, I think that's the last time I could see a statistic around it, 71% of Asia, Asia had gone digital. Um, now, I, I think this is more addressed at, at public service television uh, and, and, um, and that has an important role to play for a certain percentage of the population for emergency communication, for uh, commercial free television, uh, to give underrepresented audiences a forum to, to speak. Um, the trouble is it's sort of like 10%, less than 10% of the viewing population and it doesn't bring in the dollars. So the, the TV broadcasters that are looking at return on investment and advertising revenue have seen challenges uh, in that whole domain and there's a cost to move from analog to digital and who's going to subsidise the cost. Um, and, and that's what's caused some of the problems with, with uh, you know, most, most countries said they commit to uh, going digital by 2016 and we're only at 71% and it's going to take probably another decade to get full saturation of that. Um, I, I do see um, potential, you know, there is revenue that governments can extract from the, from the spectrum they get back. By going digital and switching off analog, they have surplus spectrum and a lot of monetized that. If that, if the monies from that spectrum was put towards um, the cost of, of the switch, uh, it makes it easier. And we see countries that have been successful have used um, uh, models like that. And, and there's, there's been an interesting model in, in, um, in, in Thailand where uh, a private company has looked to take advantage of the digital switchover. So the company is uh, next step, uh, their, their television brand is Good TV. And what they looked to do was to put a, a, a small KU band uh, DTH bouquet up, uh, do the must carry channels, which are really the government channels uh, and other free to air channels. Uh, and use subsidy that the government was putting out in, in a token format um, to subsidise the purchase of their set-top box, which would enable them to get the public broadcast television as well as content they were providing. Um, they've been challenged because there's a very strong DTH provider in that country, um, but they're slowly building a case for that, and maybe that's a model where others can follow, but uh, that's the only kind of instance where I've seen the digital switch off and subsidies being used by a private organisation looking to build uh, a new sort of uh, echo, uh, a, a new broadcast system within a country. Very good. So in terms of uh, uh, the transition, I mean, again, I say that I say that the, the, the analog uh, to digital thing is, is interesting. It's not critical. Um, more interesting is SD to HD, HD to, to UHD. So uh, without getting too far down, and, and I'm, in fact, I believe we had Good TV speak when we were in Thailand, uh, in fact, for the last time for APSCC. Um, uh, but another story. Uh, look, we're kind of reaching the end of our time. So I, I would like to wrap up, and that seems like as, as good a, a place to sort of to, you know, cut it off as anything else. Um, looking toward the future, are there other developments that we see that can, that can positively impact uh, you know, the future of, of satellite uh, the distribution of, of video in Asia Pacific. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave you for last, Bob John, because you can be pessimistic and, and we'll end on a sour note. Uh, John, do you want to start? Uh, and, then, and then, Terry, your, your final thoughts, uh, and, yeah. and then we'll, we'll go with Bob John. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Chris. I, 
Look, I mean, I think we've covered a lot of it, but but for me, it's it's this tighter integration with players like Microsoft and, and Azure and Amazon and, and AWS and, and moving content using the superpower of satellite, right, which is really our, our broad reach and our high reliability. And the more we can push content to the edge, whether that's, you know, you know, to, to a mobility use case or whether that's, uh, you know, a remote village where where people just don't have the connectivity, I, I still see a really vibrant role for us to play. And the more that we can become part of this sort of unified infrastructure um, and take, you know, content anywhere it's created to any device, uh, you know, the, 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 the more I believe and, and continue to obviously believe that, that we have a strong and bright future. Mm -hmm. Terry and then then uh, Bao Zhong. Yes, yeah, so, so so today in Asia we're delivering around 800 channels, I think to a combined audience of around 230 million people. So very relevant. Uh, we don't see that dropping much mm -hmm. in the future. And we see with the network we're designing the unified network. It's the network we think that that um, content providers, as they change their model, become interested in. It will take content to the edge, as John says. Uh, and and we think you know. Um, a consumer experience to be same to, to be to be the same wherever a consumer is will become uh, a more dominant philosophy as we move forward and and we believe um, through some of the acquisitions we've made and where we sit in the mobility um, played mobility infrastructure connecting ships planes it's going to be a really interesting avenue to explore as we go forward. Very good and and Bajong, final final thoughts from you. Uh, you don't uh, have to be okay. pessimistic. You can be <laughs> no, 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 balanced uh, and neutral. It's fine. Uh, my point is uh, satellite will continue to play a very important role in the uh, satellite distribution of videos, mm -hmm. uh, of, of good contents. And, uh, but we have to realize the difficulty and we have to be very well prepared for the difficulty. And we have to be, uh, as uh, uh, Terry and John both mentioned, uh, we have to be more innovative and try to find new opportunities and create the new opportunities for our satellite operators. So I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we, we have to give up the uh, satellite business, but uh, you know, before we realize the difficulties, uh, we cannot be more innovative. So this is uh, what I want to express. I think, yeah. In some ways, in some ways, Bajong, you basically have summarized the entire satellite industry's dilemma right now is actually how to be more innovative and, and not give up on the business. I mean, there's no question about that at all. No. So, so look, uh, Juan Bajong from APT, John Huddle from SES, Terry Bleakley from Intelsat. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, for uh, a, a very uh, interesting discussion, uh, very informative, very, very uh, uh, I won't say controversial, but it was uh, it was very good. Uh, thank you, thank you all very much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. And thank you very much for watching the latest in the APSCC webinar series. We do hope that you'll join us for the future uh, the future episodes that we have coming up. Uh, please do check out APSCC uh, sat dot com, APSCC sat dot com, where you're watching this now. Uh, you'll also find a schedule of upcoming uh, webinar topics that we'll be dealing with in coming weeks. If you're interested in, in participating, if you're interested in speaking, if you're interested in sponsoring, please do get in contact with us. Uh, and that is a different website, apscc.or.kr. Uh, look, even join the association. We'd be happy to have you as part of our, uh, part of our happy band of, of uh, uh, co-conspirators or whatever, whatever the expression happens to be. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining us this week and we look forward to seeing you again soon.